A lot of people don't like math, and the subject or class that is commonly pointed to for this distaste is algebra. But there are mathematicians that actually study algebra for a living. So what kinds of things do algebraists study? An introductory course in algebra from a theoretic point of view usually begins with group theory. A group G is a set X and a group operation commonly denoted by a dot or in some cases implied by concatenation. The group operation is a dissociative binary operation, that is, a composition where grouping in multiple instances of the operation doesn't matter. So addition is associative and subtraction is not. A group also satisfies the following properties. For each pair of elements in your group, the composition of those two elements is in your group. There is an identity element, so usually this is denoted by an E, and it's the case that E dot A equals A dot E, which is equal to A, for any A that you chose from your group. There are also inverses for every element, so if you have an element A, there exists something in the group that you can compose it with, such that you get back to the identity. Usually this is denoted as a to the negative one. That may seem like a lot of conditions to check, so let's go through an example. Take the integers and addition. We can see that the sum of any pair of integers is another integer. Zero plus any integer is that integer, and each non-zero integer has a negative counterpart, such that their sum is zero. So we have a group. The group of integers with addition is particularly nice because the operation is also commutative but that doesn't have to happen. Groups that have a commutative operation are called abelian. Another group that's more counterintuitive for those first encountering these types of objects are the dihedral groups. Even though you can do this construction for every regular polygon, I'll only do it for a square. Take a square of paper. Post notes are amazing for this if you have one lying around. Notice that if we rotate it or flip it such that a corner lines up with where our corner used to be, we still have a square. In order to keep track of the corners, we're gonna go ahead and label them on both sides with a number. Now we're gonna start with the corners in the formation one, two, four, and three, reading clockwise. Then we can flip and rotate the square as before from this position and record the clockwise reading of the corners. Here's the string that you get from rotating 90 degrees. I'll give you a second to pause the video and try to find the rest of them on your own. You should get eight different strings of numbers, each associated with eight different movements of the square. You can do nothing to the square, you can rotate it 90 degrees, you can rotate it 180 degrees or 270 degrees. Notice that rotating 360 degrees is just the same as not rotating at all. And then you can flip over the diagram over one of its four lines of symmetry. The cool thing here is that if you take any two of these movements, you get a string of numbers that you should have been able to get to in just one of the eight movements. So this operation of combining things is closed. The identity here is just to do nothing. It's not too hard to show that inverses also exist for each transformation. If you're able to find all eight things and reset the square back to one, two, four, three each time when you found something new, then you've probably already found the inverses. If not, I encourage you to try and figure out what the inverses are. And then with all these three things, we have a group. If you're a bit skeptical about the operation, in a more formal sense, doing multiple moves is the same as function composition, which is an associative binary operation. Also, while we're here, if you focus on the rotations of this group, you'll notice that with respect to the same composition, rotations only give you rotations. So we have a smaller group within a larger group. A group that is a subset of another group with the same associative binary operation is called a subgroup. Groups can produce a lot of really cool puzzles to think about as well as provide some fascinating ways to answer some seemingly elusive problems in a relatively fast way. But that's a topic for another video. Now that you've seen some groups, if you'd like some more practice in trying to show that something is a group or not, then try and determine whether or not the following are groups. Other than those exercises, that is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video and that it gave you an introduction into at least one thing that algebraists take interest in. If you like this video, subscribe for more mathematics videos. And as always, I am Nathan, this is Chalk, and I will see you next time.